Good morning or good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar where we're talking with Shopify, Jim and Coffee, the Armory, Launch Online and ourselves at Quickfire to bring you the latest on omni-channel retailing and why now is the time to really focus on your omni-channel strategy. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Dermot McSweeney from Jim and Coffee. We've got Shimona from Shopify, we've got Jay from Launch Online and we've got James from the Armory. So before we dive in, Perhaps we could just do uh, a little bit on each other's businesses. So, Dermot, I'm going to start with you. Just tell us a little bit more about Jim Plus Coffee. Sure. Thanks very much for, for having me on, guys. Delighted to join the conversation. Um, Jim Plus Coffee, uh, funny name, and we get asked a lot. But, no, we don't have a gym, and, no, we don't particularly sell coffee, although we do, like, drink a lot of it. Um, but Jim Plus Coffee is an Irish athleisure clothing company. Um, like to say that clearly because sometimes I forget to explain that part. But we we just we represent so much more than that. So the 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 idea behind the brand um, is to make life richer, um, to promote a, an active, healthy lifestyle. So we do that through the gear that we uh, that we provide to people. We do that through the events that we and the experiences that we provide for people provide for people, and we also just highlight people from our community. Um, just people who are doing incredible things, whether they're athletes, you know, yoga teachers, um, accountants who are trying to go to the Olympics, you know, um, we really, really celebrate our community. So the whole business and brand is kind of is kind of built around that. But I do have to get in the athleisure clothing part as well, because uh, sometimes I forget that. But, yeah, we've been going for uh, t uh, me and my two co-founders set it up in 2017. Um so we were an online business only for about a year and a half. Um, and then we, we took a step into pop-up retail and then permanent stores. Um, so yeah, four and a half years of uh, startup growth, Brexit, a once in a century uh, pandemic um, and, and all the things that go with that. So it's been, it's been an amazing few years and uh, we've, uh, we've, we've, We've lost lost hairs or grown grey hairs as a result of it. So it's been great one. So it's so good to have you on today and really looking forward to hearing more about your story shortly. Let's come to you next, Shimona. It's lovely to have you for I think the third or even fourth time now. Just uh for those that perhaps haven't seen one of these, please just tell everyone a little bit about your role at Shopify. Sure. Happy to. Um, I'm the managing director for Europe, Middle East and Africa at Shopify. Uh, and of course, if you don't know, and hopefully you do, Shopify is a platform that powers businesses to be able to build, scale and grow, um, be able to reach their customers in every channel that they can while providing all of the admin and ability to manage their businesses in the background. Very good. And Jay, I'm going to come to you next. I'm Jay. I'm the founder of Launch Online. We're a paid media agency for ambitious advertisers. I will come yeah. over to James and maybe come back to Jay if her audio recovers. Uh, James, I've had the pleasure of speaking with you all day today on various bits of content that we're working on, uh, not least the last episode with Danny from Warpaint for Men. What an amazing story he has. And I know that everyone in this group has a shared love for his story. Um, but James, a little bit about your, you and your business, please. So I'm James Davey. I'm one of the founders of The Armory. We're a specialist e-commerce and retail agency based up here in Norwich, helping brands scale um, using all the tools we have in our toolkit from strategic guidance, board level experience, having been in retail kind of 25, 30 years, through to flexible marketing support and working with the likes of Jay and the team at Launch Online on the paid media side. All good fun. Thank you, James. Go on, Shimona. Uh, I was going to say, Nathan, aren't we supposed to, like, we're supposed to be using the Oracle title by now with James, aren't we? Like, I feel like well, we're this is it. There. No, it should no longer be called not. James. It would just be called yeah. the Oracle. The Oracle. So yeah, if I anyone agree. got any questions, just fire them into James and we'll just watch as he answers them. For those that are listening, please do keep your questions coming. I see one question already about does this work on mobile or not? It should work on mobile. If it doesn't, don't panic. These are all recorded so you can catch up and watch it in your own time. Our objective of these sessions, Jay, James, uh, the team at Shopify and myself have all been working to make uh, this opportunity accessible to everyone. So if you have missed an episode, don't panic. Just uh, check out our YouTube channels and they're all there for everyone to see. However, today's focus is all around omni-channel retailing. Before we start, I do this every time I forget to introduce myself. My name is Nathan, co-founder of Quickfire. 
We're an e-commerce focused digital transformation agency focused on working with Shopify and Shopify Plus. And today I'll be hosting the session. So please do keep your, uh, your questions coming in. We've got an amazing panel today, but the real focus of discussion is all around omni-channel retailing. And so first of all, and Dermot, I'm gonna to start to you as our new guest. I just wanna know from you, it's one of those buzz terms that everyone's talking about, omni-channel this, omni-channel that. What is omni-channel? I think the, the easiest way to describe omni-channel is from the, the customer's perspective. Um, and omni-channel is just that you are wherever they want to shop in the easiest possible way, yeah, maybe in the clearest possible way. Um, you know, for obviously for a direct consumer brand, that means you have to have you know a web presence, which is kind of a given, but also have that retail presence as well. So, for us, then from the brand's perspective, it's that we are omnichannel in terms of there is no kind of dividing wall between you know the online team or the e-commerce team and the retail team, we are one business. And I think that comes back to, you know, uh, brands should do that nowadays because they should have an appreciation for what consumers want, making it easier, but also, you know, consumers don't really care about you and your business and your internal walls or silos. You know, they just want to have a relationship with the brand or with the product. Um, so you kind of have to be omnichannel. You know, you have to remove all the barriers and just, if they want to have the relationship, well, they should be allowed to find the relationship they have with you. So, yeah, for us, Omnichannel is is key at the moment. So is that something you realized when you set up Gym Plus Coffee originally or actually is that something you've come to learn over time? Um, I, I, I think we kind of had it instinctively first because we really understood the community of people that we wanted to connect with. Um, it probably helps that my background uh was in uh advertising uh research i had an appreciation for what customers were looking for from businesses um but you connect with a brand first and foremost um and the harder you make it um the less chance you have of that of that connection happening now we as i said we we were an online only business for for 18 months so it was pretty straightforward having one website letting the relationship develop that way um but i think over the last few years, I think we've seen clearly the the importance of retail, the fact that you can bring the relationship to the next level by bringing people into your store and having that you know uh, you know face to face uh, interaction. Um, but people just basically love the fact that they can buy something online and return it in store. You know, at a really practical level, people message us on Instagram and say, "I bought this online. It was delivered to me yesterday. It doesn't fail. I'd like to." bring it back can I go to my local store and we just say sure why not you know that it's our problem to figure out the operations in the background it shouldn't be the customer's problem you know so um I think anything where it's just made easier for the customer um you know they have enough it's hard enough to get these people you know you don't want you don't want to piss them off <laughs> once you have once you have them so just removing all those barriers is, is really really important I think Ben's put it perfectly in the comments here where he said that Omnichannel is just shopping from the consumer's perspective rather than a retailer's perspective. And so yeah. some really interesting insight, Ben, there. Thank you. Jay, I'm going to come to you. Next. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> come on, come on, Ben. You should, you should have, the, have the mic here. <laughs> Jay, I'm going to come to you next. What does Omnichannel retailing mean to you? I mean, for us, you know, what we don't want to do is be just reporting per channel on results because ultimately it's one one customer. And, you know, I think that digital marketing and digital marketeers have got into this habit of reporting per channel what return on investment is and, and not actually look at that customer experience at all the different brand touch points. I mean, I think the stat is that Google said 86% of people that bought from a new brand in lockdown aren't sure they'd ever buy from that brand again. So it's about making sure that you engage the, you know, those customers and keep them coming back. Jay, thank you. Uh, poor James, he's always last, but I'm sorry, JD, you're last again. Ladies first. Shimona, over to you. What does Omnichannel Retailing mean to you? Uh, I, maybe I'll just take um, Dermot's point a little further, because if it means removing barriers so that customers can engage with you in the way that they want to, um, I think from the perspective then of the retailer, it means doing the work to integrate your back end and to deeply understand that consumer, right? Because it's not just about 
to me, removing the barriers. It's about actually taking the time to understand that customer's buying journey and how they engage in a relationship with you. How do they want to interact with you in Instagram? How do they want to interact with you, you know, on your online store? How do they want to interact with you in your brick and mortar store and providing the experience that um, that they're looking for. So I think it's about um, us doing the work to remove the barriers, but then use that information to deeply understand the customer's journey and then present to them in the way that they want to be presented to as well, right? It's maybe rich, beautiful imagery on Instagram. Maybe it's presenting really relevant, um, you know, you know, deals and offers on the online store. It's, as Dermot said, right, being able to provide a really great experience brick and mortar to be able to either return or to engage with the brand, touch and feel products. So uh, to me, it's about like, it's that using that data to deeply understand and present in the way that they want to. I'm chuckling to myself because poor James, uh, try and follow that mate. But before <laughs> I come to you, just a quick hello to Kim uh, Hogan that said she loves that you can return an online purchase in store. Hello, Ben Finnegan, uh, Neve Garahan. The list goes on Parika. Lovely to see you all. And please do keep your questions coming in. This is a really rare opportunity to have so many amazing minds around one table. Uh, I'm just a guy that hosts it, right? But actually, we've got some four incredible people here. Do get your questions in and I'll do whatever I can to answer them. Come on in, JD. We've bigged you up as the Oracle right at the very start of this. Over to you, sir. What does Omnichannel Retailing mean to you? Martini. <laughs> That's what it means to me. I'm so there was a classic, <laughs> I'll explain why. There was a classic ad back in the late 70s, early 80s. Anytime, any place, anywhere, Martini. That's what Omnichannel means to me. It basically means shopping. Customers don't, you know, Dermot made a, a perfect point. Customers do not buy by channel, they buy from the brand. So yeah. therefore we have to be anytime, any place and anywhere. And that doesn't mean just for purchase, it means for returns, it means for customer service, it means for wrapping people up in this cotton wool of whatever Jim Plus Coffee is looking to put out and kind of advocate in its world, whatever another brand is trying to compete with. So that's, that's what it is, it's Martini, with or without Olive. <laughs> so good. <laughs> yeah, JD's perfect as always. Now, of course, Omni Channel, we all focus on, uh, yeah, okay, it's all about the consumer, but actually, it's not just about the consumer. It's the consumer, the retailer, it's the combination of the two. Let's just focus just on the retailer in terms of Omni Channel. Dermot, how has it helped you in your business by taking that Omni Channel approach? What's it done in terms of efficiency or operations uh, that actually perhaps the customer doesn't see? Yeah, well, to be honest, I could come up with a really, really uh, you know, intelligent sounding answer. Uh, but the key thing is simplicity. Um, you know, if, particularly if you're a small growing business, um, you're removing the barriers for yourself as well. And I think that comes back to, I, I would kind of call omni-channel and like direct to consumer, you know, kind of interchangeably. Um, over the last few, few years, we've just seen massive growth. I don't think we would have spent so much time and energy trying to figure out how to interact with a retailer or how to get the supply chain correct to deliver to one of these massive uh, retailers in the correct way on Oxford Street or something like that. You know, that would take, you know, uh, a career to figure out, um, you know, how to how to nail that. But what we've been able to do is just focus on ourselves and focus what works for us and our team um, and our back end. And look, we might have made mistakes along the way as well. But um, from an operational perspective, you can only you can only um, really, you know, tackle so many problems. So at least we knew that it was always about our store and, and you know, if we made any mistakes, it was our fault. But if we delivered on time to certain locations, um, we were to benefit. And then it's over to our teams. That's what I, I love, the, the, just that direct model um, with the omni-channel um, benefit for the customer. Everything is, if you interact with Jim Plus Coffee, you interact with us, you know, there's, there's no other, there's no one other in between. So if we fall down, that's our fault. And if and if we provide a great, you know, experience for the customer, that that's a, that's a pat on the back for us as well. So I think the key thing really is simplicity, particularly when you're a small, you know, growing business. So I'm going to have to move you to last to answer some of these questions because it's a bloody hard act to follow. But Shimona, let's come to you in terms of what benefits can Shopify merchants expect to see if they take an omni-channel approach rather than the customer side. What about the retailer side? Yeah, I mean, what's great is, I mean, particularly with the Shopify platform is the ability to really pivot and experiment with channels really, really seamlessly, right? And I think 
that's what's really important right now is there's no point in time that you're going to deeply understand your customer base and that's how they're behaving you know from here on out and forever and ever we know that channels are changing drastically and so uh, i think what's really cool about an omni-channel approach is continuing to use the opportunity to experiment in different channels see how customers engage see what conversion looks like see what's working for you and if it doesn't to pivot and try another channel right so if you are all in in a singular channel or you don't have your you know, you don't have your back end connected, you're actually going to lose so much learning and understanding of your customer and how they're, they're, they're kind of navigating through the journey. So to me, I think the benefit is agility and experimentation and constant learning. James and Jay, uh, anyone want to add anything to this? If not, I'm going to come to our first audience question from Ben Finnegan. I I just like to say, you know, I I think that it's a shame when brands just choose channels to broadcast. You know, it's like broadcasting adverts, like buy this, sell this. You know, um, this is what we're telling you, and they don't use channels to interact with customers, to ask them questions, to create a community. You know, it's not uh, marketers don't you know shouldn't just be looking at what what we're gaining from each of these channels, but also how can we speak to those customers, get them to feed in with product and you know product things. Um, that they could, you know, influence. Like, what do you think about our new color range, and 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 make it a much more interactive and experiential experience. <laughs> JD, anything to add? If not, I'm going to go to Ben's question. So Ben's asked a question, which actually I'm really interested around in terms of the difficulties around attribution. Uh, it's a question for Dermot, which is around: Have you uh, any measurement of online purchases that may have been driven by offline content, or vice versa, online purchases driven by offline content? Maybe the question is: How do you measure digital effectiveness in driving offline sales? You may be muted. Thank you. Uh, That's not, good. The, not the first time I've made, not the first time I've made that mistake in the last year. Um, uh, it, this all comes down to e email capture in store um, and quickly quickly becoming probably the most important metric uh, in the business when you know when we had stores first it was like oh that would be a nice way of uh, you know of capturing the customer data and just being able to track uh, those journeys a bit better but now we we've incentivized um, store teams to you know receipt by email capture the email address because then we can it can all flow back to is that customer an online customer already um we can do it uh, we can track uh, digital campaigns into offline uh, conversions i would say in quite a limited way at the moment um through uh, through the facebook platform but it definitely could be could be much better in terms of specific campaigns and specific conversions but i think at an overall level when we stand back on a monthly or a quarterly basis um you know just the benefit of being on an omni-channel platform like shopify is that we know who the customer is you know we know that they like to jump between the two or we know that they like to just be a store customer or we know that they like to just be that one store customer you know only their local store in their local uh, city um but but yeah the benefit here is is uh is just being a data-led company, which, uh, you know, maybe five years ago, maybe a clothing company, you know, wouldn't have been so data obsessed, but we are because that's how we're building, you know, the future of the company. So it all comes down to email capture. If if uh, if the team kind of lose that focus, then us as a as a head office or a digital marketing team, we're we're not as intelligent as we could be, basically, because we don't have the information to make the decisions. But yeah, it could be to answer Ben's question. It could be much better, but uh, you know, we're starting where we're starting from, basically. <laughs> Guys, I'm absolutely loving this. We are inundated with questions. And so I'll try and get through them as quickly as possible. JD, I just want to touch upon your experience with Jules and years in retail. How have you managed to solve that attribution challenge between was it offline that generated this sale? Was it online? Was it a combination of the two? Uh, tell us a little bit more. So I think, you know, um, Dermot had it from a data perspective. You need a single view of the customer, not necessarily a single customer view, which is this big behemoth database, but I turn it the other way around, a single view of that customer. Email address mm -hmm. is incredibly important. Capturing and Shopify has made that super easy. Historically, you'd have to buy into another platform to do your kind of digital receipting, I suppose, is the way that most brands look at it. So, you know, how easy is it to say, would you like to receive a you know digital receipt? Therefore, if you lose it, you can always return it. There's always value exchange that has to happen. 
<coughs> excuse me. So the main thing there was trying to make sure that we didn't um, at Jules, we start, we built a customer database that allowed us to see that cross channel behavior. And that was also across things such as eBay and obviously not Amazon because they masked their email addresses, but we could understand that buyer behavior and then tailor our communications to make sure we weren't telling a in-store buyer, shop online, shop online, shop online. We told them about their local store, what was new in, what was rated by that local store, for example. Because that's what was really important to them. Sadie, I think you've earned yourself a drink. Uh, very good. Thank you. Uh, Shimoda, I'm, yeah, I'm going to come to you shortly. Um, but before I do, uh, Jay, someone just said, super explanation, bringing the customer on the journey and engaging with them at every step across all platform is absolutely key. So a little shout out for Jay there. But in terms of Shimona, over to yourself. How have you found Shopify merchants wrestle between that attribution across online and offline? Um, I, I actually, there's not a lot more I can add to what both Dermot and the Oracle have just shared with us. <laughs> I, I actually love, James, how you flipped from, uh, you know, this the single customer view, because that's exactly, you know, the kind of uh, demystification we need to do when you've got mounds and mounds of data. How do you actually take a look at it holistically? Um, and that, and I think that's, actually what's most important right because when you're when you're growing and scaling and when you've got multiple channels you're managing and you're experimenting taking the time to really understand that journey understand that view it allows you then you know if it's a really great you know if it's a, a flash sale if it's a new product drop or if it's a sale then you better understand you know the influence a channel maybe has had on that sale and then you can better nail your marketing mix and your budgeting strategy right and and again fast paced environment that we're working in it allows people to put the money in the right places so that they're growing in the right places and being really intelligent with it so that you're again you're maximizing your efforts and your budget which i know is really tough when you're managing really of multiple um multiple channels for someone with not much to add that was pretty comprehensive shimona thank you oh, thanks <laughs> jake gonna come to you as i know you've got a little point here and then i've got a question specifically for you oh brilliant um i, I think that data hygiene is something that companies really need to get to grips with the amount of times that we look at people's mm. google analytics or their or their data coming through and it isn't as accurate as it could be you won't get a hundred percent accuracy but being aware that we are moving to a more cookie-less world that we need to look at things not just from a user id point of view but understand interactions on the page based on events really getting to grip with your data hygiene, clearing it up, and then not using mm. the kind of channel data to bash teams over the head of what return on investment you've got, but instead for how things are working together that you can better speak to the customer at the right time on the method of communication that they want to hear from. And so it's using that for, for, for you know, for planning, but hygiene, it's all about getting getting everything cleaned up. So, mate, it sounds like you've got a point to add there on data hygiene. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that point. Just from a from a brand's point of view, uh, it's it's so challenging, like on a week to week basis, with so many things fluctuating in you know the industry, the marketplace happening with the consumer. That if you're so reliant on some of the bigger platforms for your conversions, you know what you know about your customer. Um, Data hygiene is key, but then that that owned relationship, you know, for us, um, email has just been the number one channel, the number one relationship, um, you know, um, that kind of integration of Clavio and Shopify has really just been, you know, fuel to our fire over the last, you know, couple of years. Um, and we just know so much more on based on how intelligent those platforms are talking to one another. But couldn't couldn't agree more with the data hygiene point i think if you're if you you might not be looking at 100 percent clean data all of the time that's just the nature of it but if if you if you know you're looking at messy data then it's a dangerous recipe i think for making making decisions based on just the wrong information you know damn it thank you we're gonna quickly go through some fan mail uh we've got one gym plus coffee is the gold standard of a consumer centric brand from their consumer first yeah. approach to the service to their best in class use of ugc <laughs> on social anyone attending this event that is not following them on socials get on it so great work i heard a round of applause from jd there but great work jessica nolan thank you 
And then I've also got one for Jay. Um, super explanation, Jay. Based on what you said, do you think brands need to move away from looking at return on ad spend or ROAS as an end goal if they need to engage with the customers more? Oh, here we go. <laughs> um, I, I I don't think that we should get rid of it as a as a metric. I think it's really important because if you're utilizing smart bidding and automation, it can be a really powerful way to point the machine in the right direction. But it shouldn't be the be all and end all metric. We should be looking at new customer acquisition. We should be looking at you know at, at um, lifetime customer value. That's like my favorite one. But ultimately, collecting that data compliantly and not just relentlessly stalking people online um, trying to get that return on ad spend up jay thank you i've got uh millions of questions coming in uh, i've also got a bit of fan mail for myself so thank you michael <laughs> much appreciated uh, i'm going to come to lisa's question next which is stores will be more important than ever especially for d2c brands entering the physical space the insights they can gather from online metrics are invaluable have you seen any digitally native brand miss the mark when engaging with customers offline as they don't have that physical store experience? Uh, feel free to chuck your name in the hat if anyone wants to go. If not, I'll just pick on you. Uh, I'm, JD, I'm that gonna... cough sounds like you. Uh, Over to you yeah. so I'm, as you know, I'm always one for hiding behind a bushel. Um, I'm not going to name a brand because ultimately I think it's not necessarily unfair. It's just because I just keep naming them. Um, but I think most brands that are direct to consumer worry about going into retail. They believe it is incredibly costly. They look at it as a, as a, uh, almost like a sales prevention channel. When in fact, it is one of the biggest drives of brand equity we have in the marketplace. What it is trying to understand is you're not trying to drive profitability of a single channel. You're trying to drive profitability of a business. Across. And therefore, trying to utilize the data you have, the channels you have, and being Martini, or as a gentleman said, possibly Campari, because I was probably drunk on Martini <laughs> at the time. But there was, it's about making sure you use stores in the right way. Now, let's think about Argos as a platform. One tenth of its floor estate is the experience. And let's be honest, it's Argos. You expect what you get. Nine tenths is stock. Now, as an omni-channel business, with stock in your retail stores, it means you can get product to a consumer within less time on click and collect or same day collection than you can from a warehouse as a direct -to consumer brand. Think about that as a direct -to consumer and how you can solve the last mile delivery issue. I'll leave it at that. JD, any, anyone? Go on, Shimona. Well, actually, maybe I'll share even like a, a flip side thought on like how, uh, let me share Allbirds story with Omnichannel and leveraging brick and mortar because I love what they do. They've, one of the things that they've done with Omnichannel is they've boosted conversions by using buy in store and ship to customer uh, and direct and quick shipping, which has allowed them to now, you know, maximize the space they're using and use it for people to come in and experience their brand versus again having like stocks and stocks of product and looking like a little distribution center right and so right. it's all about coming in if you go into an albert store they're beautiful but they're spacious and you can sit and you can learn about the product and you can like touch and feel the product and so they've actually found that they've increased uh conversion by uh, in being able to implement buy online and then ship to. And then my, again, I, we're coming back to like knowing your customer across all channels. My personal experience just uh, in the last couple of weeks, I wandered in on the Marlebone High Street here in London. I wandered into the store. I realized I must have a new color of tree dashers in my life, but I couldn't remember what size I'd ordered. Two seconds for them to quickly look it up, tell me what size I have, and for them to then be able to help me with that order. If they didn't know that about me on the spot, I would have, they would have lost the conversion right there, right? I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna have to wait and figure it out. Maybe I'm gonna order online, maybe I'll get to it. But they were able to know me on the spot, help me with that, and convert me really quickly. So um, I love what they've been doing with uh, being able to create, again, the connection to the brand, the authenticity, and the space for people to experience the brand by being able to ship to me afterwards. And so I'm going to come to you. Go on, Jenny. I was going to say 30% of transactions in a retail store can't be converted because it's wrong size or wrong color. Yeah. yeah. So you're How simple. Like, you know, order in store. It's, it's as simple as that. Yep. I'm going to restore some order back in this place. Derm, I'm going to come to you afterwards. Uh, I knew, JD, always breaking the rules. 
Uh, Joe, I'm going to come to you shortly. I'm just going to give Jay a little opportunity to add anything she would like. If not, I'll come straight to you because I've got two questions for you. Jay, Great. anything to add? No, I, I think that that stat's a really interesting stat. I hadn't heard that before, 30%. Um, so, you know, it that's great knowledge, Oracle. <laughs> we can always rely on the Oracle. Devin, I'm Random coming to you next. Yeah. <laughs> Same with um, enough conviction, eh? Come on, Devin, over to you. I, yeah, I, I could, we've got, we've, how long do we have left? I could, I could chat for the rest of, the rest of this conversation about uh, the benefits of having your retail locations alongside your, your digital presence. Um, There's just so many reasons. I understand certain brands would be hesitant, but the world is, it, it, there's just such opportunity there. For us, we're all about, you know, building communities um, and building a community around this brand that one of the best places to do that is in an in-store uh, environment. Um, we've done a fantastic job over the last few years. We now have nine uh, store locations and they're all community hubs. You know, we've held events there. We've recorded podcasts there. We've had panel events for International Women's Day. We've had yoga mornings, uh, coffee mornings. You know, people meet there, run clubs, leave from our stores, you know, Please, someone explain to me how you do any of that uh, purely online. Uh, we try to during COVID and Instagram Live just isn't the same. Um, also, I, I back our store teams, you know, every time to create an amazing environment and then afterwards probably upsell a few people on, on a few on a few things. Um, another, another part for me, which people seem to forget sometimes, I think, James, you might have mentioned it, is there is a media presence and, a, and brand equity to having a store in a high footfall area, which it won't be on any uh, spreadsheet that you find or won't be on any media plan. Um, but people walking by and seeing your store is very reassuring uh, from a trust factor as well. So there's a lot of benefits. I, I literally, I could go on here uh, on a big list. Uh, click and collect is you know similar to what you mentioned, Shimona. Um, our store managers are hugely in favor of click and collect again because it just brings more people into the store you can you have the opportunity to talk to this person uh, whether it's been already the purchase has already happened it doesn't really you know it doesn't really matter they're coming into the store and you get a chance to to chat to them we actually opened a, a new store uh, last friday um and i went down to the store opening and you cannot replicate the buzz of a new store you know and we've been online for you know doing our best as much as we could during all of covid and to go down for two hours to a store opening and just see the reaction of people and talk to people and see how they feel about the brand it's uh yeah you can as re read as many instagram comments as you want um but uh, there's no replicating uh, that in-store experience I'll leave you to have two seconds, have yourself a drink, and then I'll be coming straight back to you with another question from Ben. Before we do, just a reminder for everyone today, hugely honoured to be joined um, by Dermot from Gym Plus Coffee, from Shimona from Shopify, from Jay from Launch Online, and James from The Armoury. Please do keep your questions coming. We've got about 30 minutes left, and this is an unbelievable opportunity to ask these guys some of the brightest minds in retail some really pressing questions that you want to ask so please do ask away uh ben i'm going to come to your questions next then what's the plan for future targeting following the change to cookies yeah that's uh, the big challenge of the of the month to be honest uh, or maybe of the year uh, for the digital marketing team we've had to make uh, you know significant significant changes there in terms of what we're doing but it doesn't change what we've probably been doing for the last number of years, which we've, which is we've always, always focused on our own channels. So I mentioned, um, I mentioned email uh, a number of uh, a number of minutes ago. Um, that is our most important channel, um, and, and having the relationship built that way. Uh, I think Jay uh, mentioned lifetime value. You know, that is the easiest way to kind of measure that on a on an ongoing an ongoing basis. I mentioned uh, Clavio, but just our own social channels as well. We put a lot of work. Uh, into them um, I know there's kind of pros and cons to that uh, approach as well but we are really for the first time now I think kind of coming out of COVID looking at diversifying the the kind of comm strategy a bit more um, not relying on on uh, the old uh, the old uh, big two or whatever you want to call it but yeah it's it's changed a lot of things and 
it's hard to know exactly where that will bottom out because there's a lot of change in the in the marketplace at the moment anyway you know i think consumers are experiencing a strange time in life you know where i'm not sure you can read into your roas results too much at the moment given restrictions are easing and everybody wants to get outside so yeah it's um it, it's the big challenge and um it will be a hard few months ahead i think in kind of figuring out where that where that lands so we've just had a question coming in around good up or well, good examples of omni-channel retailing and what i think i'll do is just do a little round robin here so everyone has a chance to just say someone that they've seen when they've been on their travels that has been doing omni-channel really well uh only positive vibes uh we can't use gym plus coffee in this example because we know they're the gold standard so they're ruled out uh and jd for once i'm going to come to you first well, I'd like to recommend a brand called Coffee Plus Gym. Um, but, uh, uh, so, no, the, I think to be quite honest, this is this is a stock answer from anyone who comes from a retail background. Let's be honest, John Lewis have been at this game for quite a while. And actually, for that particular market sector, they have the experience worked out for their target customer and they're only really just kind of starting to get to a point where their data and everything else is giving them the insight they need so i'd say from a and they they were you know it's a, this sounds really big i sat on the stage with a guy that actually came up with the term omnichannel in a conference we were on a panel and he said omnichannel and that kind of then started the whole kind of why uh, what does this thing mean um but it's it's the bit around they've really focused on the service first and I think that for me is where omnichannel actually makes sense. So you're focusing on the service and your product. And ultimately between those two things, as long as you're giving the customer the right experience and that product matches what the customer is looking for in terms of quality, service and value, they're always the three match, aren't they? Then you're going to be in a good place. The data can happen and can come later to a degree. But the great thing about Shopify as a platform, as an example, is that it captures that data by default if you use its pause tool and you use e-commerce as part of the function. So um, that's kind of my 10 penneth. Jay, I'm going to come to you next. Jay, you there? Not sure Jay is there. Therefore, I'm going to come to Shimona and then back to Jay. Shimona, is there any, you mentioned a couple of examples earlier, any retail stores that you see really adapting to Omnichannel and doing it very well? Yeah, I'm going to go to a slightly different, uh, maybe vertical. Uh, and one I've been so excited about in the last year is Face Gym. Uh, and I don't know if anyone knows that brand, but they're actually founded in the UK uh, and they've also got physical locations in New York and LA. Um, so Face Gym actually is kind of a spa uh, offering workouts and facials. And of course, uh, you know, they, it, which is a very physical experience, obviously, right? You can't get a facial online, but as we went into COVID and all of their locations were shut down, they did a phenomenal job of really pivoting online. And if you take a look at what they've done now, you've got the physical locations, which are thankfully reopening, where you can actually go experience their offering, their original spa offering, and buy their products, and they've been launching many. You've got their online store uh, that we launched about a year ago for them, where again, you can go online, you can buy products, you can book personal online classes for how you can actually, you know, work out and massage your own face. And they did a great job of using Instagram Live. For them, it made sense because they're offering, um, you know, different than Dharmit is, you know, kind of neck up. And they'd have their product educators actually run classes every week for you to actually follow along and learn how to massage your own face. They started bringing in celebrities who were with them and having really great conversations. And so they started to build a really great weekly community and following and offering. And then they've been using TikTok to uh, like, again, just quick educational videos and snippets and tips so people can learn and engage with the brand and get and then brought back in. So you've got experiencing their core offering in store, being able to buy their products. You can actually buy them online. You're going through education and community building and Instagram live. And you've got TikTok again for more educating from uh, from from their their uh, their influencers. So I've been just in love with what they've done and how they've pivoted in the last year. Great share, Shimona. Thank you. And Devin, I'm going to come to you next. Is there anyone, and once again, we can't mention Jim Plus Coffee, anyone that's really getting Omnichannel right? I'll just come back at James with Jim plus T. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, yeah, we focus on so many. Uh, Shimona mentioned all birds. You know, you're kind of up there in a kind of gold standard of of everything, um, you know, from, from design all, all the way to the store experience. Um, I think one brand maybe that you 
might not hear a lot of in these kind of examples is Brewdog, um, totally different vertical, different approach to us um, or, or what we're doing, but community obsessed, um, you know, really data focused and, and really, you know, James mentioned service, you know, they are, they are laser focused on what their community is into um, and really, you know, what they can do to, to provide just the best experience across all platforms. I kind of follow them everywhere. Um, there's a brew dog in Dublin, and it's all just you know so consistent. It's a very, 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 um, very, very cool brand. Um, I think you know Rafa is a kind of a similar example that would be kind of closer to home for uh, for Jim Plus Coffee anyway. But again, I think it's you know it's it's coming back to what we started talking about uh, right at the start of the of the conversation, which is just what is what does your community want? You know what barriers you're removing? What are they into? So whether that's online or in store or wherever is you're just providing that. So I think those brands are, are really excellent at doing that. We're going to give Jay an attempt uh, to share her omnichannel story. Uh, Jay, who do you think is doing it really well? So I was going to say that um, Peloton, I thought, was doing it really well. I'm a massive Peloton fan. Normally, I'm in a room. Normally, Jay is somewhere. Both the in store experience of going. That... Sorry, Jay, carry on. We lost you. <laughs> <laughs> so so with Peloton, you can go into the store, you can try out the bike, they've got the merchandise there, but it's that customer service, like Shimona was saying, it's that customer service first, first approach. It doesn't matter if you go in store or if you go online or you go onto one of their chat channels on social, on their website, but they are absolutely nailing that customer service, that sense of community, and you get the same experience no matter what channel you're on. Perfect, Jay. Thank you. Then I've got um, stacks of questions coming in for you. So, Shimona, Jay, James, get yourself a cup of tea and we'll just have 20 minutes with Dermot to go through these. But uh, one question we've been asked is around uh, any panelists' opinions on the best software for tracking brand mentions or brand awareness across social channels. Have any of you come across some tools that you would happily recommend that can do just that? JD, I see you're nodding your head. I'll come to you first. So I think um, we've got it in chat. So Ben's made a very good point. Ben Finnegan Sprinkler is a really good tool. I think you've also got Social Bakers, which has been out there for quite a while. They're both at the slightly higher end on the pricing level, if I'm honest. Once you start to get into digging into numbers, they're incredible what they do. I think there's one tool there that does a little bit. So um, if you take SEM Rush, for example, which is a tool that everyone uses for SEO or search monitoring, more marketing monitoring, now actually, it actually has quite an unknown feature of social listening and also so brand mentions within its tool um, that just comes part of its package. You can you, you can start that tool with kind of ninety nine dollars a month. So um, you know there's a couple of there for for all kind of price brackets. Uh, Demo, any to add there, or would you also say uh, that solution is, is uh, fine? That yeah, we use we use Semrush. Um, I have used Sprinkler in the past. Um, we use Sprout Social. There's a number of ones. I think it's it's kind of less about the platform and and how much you actually kind of lean into it and, and really activate it amongst the team. Um, a lot of these things can do a lot of things for you, but if you're not really, you know, incorporated into weekly meetings or conversations, that they, they're kind of just happen in the background. So, yeah, it's just about using any of them really. Thank you, Jessica. I hope that's answered your question. And please do let us know if you've got any further questions. Please do keep your questions coming in, folks. We've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, like I said, amazing opportunity to speak to four really incredible minds around the world of retail. Paddy, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, Paddy's followed the Gym Plus Coffee uh, brand since launch back in the day. It's been phenomenal to follow their growth, to see their presence today, both online and in store. Some Irish brands can find it difficult to break into the UK markets. What advice would Dermot give for smaller brands starting out with dreams of growing outside of their home country? And I guess this is actually going to come to all of you in terms of internationalization and starting on that journey. But we'll start with that Irish example with yourself, Dermot, and then I'll come around to all of you around tips for internationalization going forwards. Great. And thanks, Paddy, for the question. And he has been an extremely long time uh, supporter of the brand. So thanks very much. Um, uh, what I would say about that is, is you know, there's a technical point of view, which, um, you know, uh, you know, again, a shout out to Shopify in terms of those things make it a lot easier in terms of just having the stores set up, um, you know, whether that's online or, or in-store around uh, POS and things like that. And obviously all systems and teams talking to one another, which makes everything a lot easier when you're working in different locations. But from a kind of a more of a strategic, maybe brand point of view, Yes, moving into a bigger market like the UK, which is much more competitive, is a real, real challenge. But 
what we focused on really is building our community in a really authentic way. So people will connect with the brand if they connect with the brand. You know, we, we are slowly moving out. Um, in 2017, people who connected with the brand were uh, us and three of our moms, you know, and it's kind of kept going from there. So if you, uh, you know, if you really are into what we're doing, um, you will find us and you'll you'll stick to us. Um, you know, our customer service is top notch. Our product is amazing. I think our brand message is extremely positive and we're a really supportive community. So at the moment, we are connecting with people in the UK who are into that. So you have to stay really, really consistent. And, you know, yes, you might have to flex a small bit depending on, you know, a store in London versus a store in Manchester that we have at the moment. But really, it's about saying the same thing over and over again for, you know, for years and just making it relevant for people's lives. Um, I would be really, really... Um, kind of laser focused on that in terms of just being a really consistent brand because there's enough brands out there you need to just uh, repeat the same thing over and over for people we've had a question come in around gen z consumers which we'll come back to um but jd anything for you to add there uh, on that point i think that you know the uk and ireland we're very lucky that actually from a from a mindset and an emotional connection perspective we are not that dissimilar. There are definitely regional nuances, absolutely. Even within Ireland itself, there are regional nuances like the UK. The one thing I would always canvas is if you are looking to scale your business outside the UK, do not believe that your approach can be whitewashed onto every single territory, um, even down to a product level. So, you know, just something as simple as you sell outerwear in the winter here in the UK please don't think at exactly the same time of year you're going to be able to sell that product in Australia because it's going to be quite warm. So, But it does also allow you to tailor your strategy. The great thing about having a platform that allows you to have multiple domains and multiple stores all within one ecosystem is that you can trade that platform relevant to that market. What it doesn't change is what Dermot came back to, which is the essence of your brand. That you should not change because ultimately you then become a, a fragmented entity trying to cater for multiple different worlds in different kind of ways. And that becomes really one too hard to start to question whether in fact, if it's working in South Korea, shouldn't we apply that in the UK? Maybe that's a good idea. And it actually dilutes you as a business. So I think there's two things. One is operational and um, you know capability, kind of how you do stuff, trade it. And then the other bit is around not losing sense of who you are, which I think is exactly what Dermot said. Shimona, gonna to come to you next about dipping your toes in, in different channels. Uh, perhaps you can shed some light on this. Yeah, uh, I've seen this uh, many ways with so many of our brands who are trying to figure out how to go international. It, it, uh, I think where some of the fear comes in is like, I must have it all figured out and have my investment plan ready and go all in now. And that's really scary, right? And again, I think what um, so much of what we've been talking about is the ability to learn and pivot. Um, Gymshark is a phenomenal example, actually, of like thinking through well on how to go international. Like, again, unicorn company, fat, one of the fastest growing brands in the world, like an influencer community like we all like would dream of. But what they did to start to figure out how they were going to grow internationally, particularly in the States and in Canada, they've been experimenting with with pop-up experiences in cities all over the world to get a gauge for how is the how are we perceived here as a brand what is going on how are we connecting who's showing up what is the behavior they've done that in toronto they've done that in new york they did that in manchester even as they were just thinking about you know domestically how to grow they did it in la and they've been doing that purposely not just to ex uh, extend the brand influence but they've been doing it so they can learn how they're being perceived how they might show up and then how they can more intentionally and in a more smart way extend their brand and of course look what they've done and and the influence they've built and and how they're growing the another really great example if we took up the other end of like a smaller business trying to figure out how to grow um omalola jewelry is one of my favorite stories started by two sisters uh you know out of their family home selling you know west african inspired jewelry while they were you know continuing their careers on the side in law and in speech pathology um you know all other retailers of course shut down last year and they started playing with TikTok, right and so they pivoting telling their story showing their product and really building a community 
And that became how they started to naturally build this international brand and connection because they were discoverable, right? We know that people want to go and discover brands in TikTok and that there's no borders. There's no UK borders to TikTok. And so all of a sudden you have this natural connection to people and this growth that starts to pull you into other countries. And so I think my, my suggestion always to folks is like, don't feel like you have to have it all figured out and then go all in. Find ways that you can experiment and figure out where you're resonating, how you're resonating and how you can show up. So I'll allow, I'll allow you to grab two secs because I'm coming straight back to you in a second. But just quickly, Jess has very politely said she doesn't want to hog all the questions, but she's got a question around agency versus in-house when it comes to digital marketing and media buying. Now, Jay, as someone that does digital from an agency, I dare say that the answer may be agency, but I know you well enough by now to know that you'll try and give a balanced opinion. So, Jay, what do you think? Digital, in-house, agency? And you may be muted. Yes. Bingo, bingo. Um, yes. ultim ultimately, it's it's about skills. And if you've got those skills in house, then great. But most brands don't. And, you know, we invest more than 20% of our time in learning, in professional development in making sure that we're staying ahead of, of the curve. And, and we utilize our, you know, our uh, relationships with Shopify, with Google, with Microsoft, with TikTok and Pinterest. Um, and that's kind of a concentration of skills all in one place, which not all brands have the luxury of, of having in-house. So it's all about skills, really, I'd say. Jay, thank you. JD, I know you guys do a bit of a digital as well. Is that something that you, again, suggest in-house, uh, external or similar to Jay? Just all depends on the skill set available. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd put my other hat on in terms of, you know, having run big e-commerce teams within brands. I suppose the question I have is, definitely around skill set but it's also around understanding the speed of knowledge transfer that you can get by doing what i classify as more of a hybrid i think there's a real need to have someone in a business who can challenge your agency around their effectiveness direction and join them up with your wider marketing plan that understands the world they're working in the bit that makes an agency incredibly powerful is the ability for them to scale when you don't have to so therefore they can put an expert on google shopping that's been doing it for five years and that's all they do an expert on facebook because that's all they do an expert on twitter because that's all they do for example and that for me is where i found the best balance where you've got someone who really knows it who's probably come from an agency such as jay's who's been really good that wants to go client side but can really have good conversations with an agency about what works and what doesn't and challenge them and then have an agency that can scale at pace for you to get stuff done guys i appreciate we've got eight minutes left and i'm getting all sorts of requests including autograph requests please just keep those for uh, perhaps another conversation damn it, you're a popular guy um but yeah i'm going to come back to this next question uh, i'm going to start with you damn actually as you're our guest today just talking around recent research shows that gen z consumers want to break away from the algorithm and discover new experiences but also really value personalized experiences how do we think brands can marry the two together yeah, it's a really interesting, really, really interesting question and interesting dynamic. We we kind of see that a lot in, in social, um, you know, just people trying to discover new things. Um, definitely in a, in the last couple of weeks, we announced that uh, Niall Horan, uh, previously of One Direction, was a, an investor, an advisor to the brand, which brought a lot of attention from a certain cohort, particularly uh, in the States which was really cool, but people are discovering you for the first time. So that just obviously really answered a need that they had. And they just spent the last month basically discovering who we were and everything about us. But I would see that question. There are two very different need states. So, you know, people are wanting to discover things in terms of experiences, but the personalized experience they want is for something where they need a lot of convenience. You know, so they're looking for, you know, physical experiences, um, you know, going out, going to a brand event somewhere, going to a pop up store, feeling like they're in a, you know, a big city or something and going to something new. But when it comes to personalized experiences, that's where they already know who you are and they want it right now and they want you to remember their previous order. And I think it's a very, very different need states. I think, you know, people would be incorrect to kind of, you know mash the two up uh, if you're developing a marketing strategy one is just delivering on your promise of a really really good service the other is just being a really cool interesting brand doing cool stuff you know 
Um, and I think the only way to to answer that is just to keep doing what you're doing. And if people like what you're doing, they'll find you, you know. But um, uh, yeah, I think I think they're two very, very different things uh, in my view anyway. Shimona, going to come to you next and then we're going to do a final round robin to cap off today. Uh, so, Shimona, in terms of this Gen Z conundrum, I guess, between experience and everything else, what, what do you think we can do about it? I, I think actually Jarman put it really, really well. And like to, if I'm understanding what you just said, Jarman, it sounds like the difference between this brand knows me and this brand understands me, right? And gets who I am, right? Do they understand me as a person, a personality, as a cohort? And then do they know me and my history and my size and, and all and all of those things? And so I, I think that we there's absolutely right, right? Those are two different things. Um, to understand me is to know that I'm gonna be really excited by apparently Niall Horan, you know, becoming an investor and helping me to connect to the brand. And to know me is to know what my my history was and you know what I might be interested in next. And so um, it's, uh, it feels like one is like connection to brand and creating a better community, creating um, deeper engagement, you know, bringing customers back, wanting them to learn more. And the other is, you know, lifetime value and conversion and ensuring and, and all of those things, right? So it's marrying together because just as Dharma said, it's, it's actually two things that need to fit together as a complete puzzle versus one or like an and or type of thing. So, folks, to finish off today in our final five minutes, the last question I've got is if everyone listening can take one thing out of today in terms of starting their omni-channel retailing strategy, what would it be and why? And, J.D., you can guess where you're coming in this order. Um, Jay, I'm going to start with you. Um, I, data hygiene and don't fear a cookie-less world. You know, if you are compliant and you and you and you're you know you're asking people their cookie preferences, you're still going to get about seventy-five percent of data. So it's you know don't fear a cookie-less world. Uh, Dermot, let's come to you next. For me, I think someone mentioned it uh, earlier in the conversation was that you know brands have a have a that hesitancy around around going into going into physical retail and. I think what Shimona said was just experimentation. So she mentioned experimentation in terms of new markets, but experiment with these physical experiences. You know, actually over the next 12 months, there will never be a better time in the next 10 years to snap up some, uh, you know, pop-up locations uh, in, in most of the big cities in the world. So we started uh, three years ago with a two week pop up store um we we knew right there and then that we were going in and out for two weeks uh, and that would just be a fun event and we're still there and now we have eight other locations so for me it's 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 taking all the good things that you've created online and bringing it to pre, to that physical experience um and and for me that's a that's a real modern omni channel strategy uh Shimona coming to you. Yeah, I'm actually going to expand upon the experimentation um, theme there is uh, making sure that you're actually experimenting across channels. Right. And that's the that's I think what the real benefit here is of Omnichannel having that back end, which we've talked about now is if there's anything I can say is, you know, don't be scared of of playing with new channels, of playing with different strategies and new channels and figuring out whether this is, you know, a, a brand connection play, a community play, is this a conversion play? So play with different ideas. Don't stick to one thing. Learn, move on, continue. That's how you're going to figure out your appropriate mix. I think it was James who said it across the board in channels, right? Not optimizing per channel. Thank you. And JD, coming to yourself, last but not least. So I'm going to talk specifically to wholesale brands out there, those that are selling direct to consumer through their wholesale stockists. Don't be afraid. You can balance the conversation of stockist and direct consumer. There are customers on the high street walking into a department store or a retailer right now who will want to go and buy your product online, wherever that is. You will lose some stockists by doing it. They're the ones you don't want because they're the ones that will be selling 90% of the stuff you send them through Amazon. That's opening no doors. That's not creating any value for you as a brand. That's just selling stock. You can do that. So don't hide behind the conversation of what have our stockists complained to us? That is not the right mentality. It's more around how can we build our brand and build our margin through being clever about opening up more channels. It's been done before. Don't be afraid. It is absolutely possible. 
Boom. And what a way to finish. For those that have stayed with us and are listening, a massive thank you for all of your questions. It's made my job incredibly easy. It's so lovely to see you all taking part. Just a quick shout out for all the episodes we've done previously. This isn't the first one. We give up an hour every month to have the chance to talk with Shopify, with James, with Jay, and with special guests like Dermot today. We were talking about Pinterest and their new relationship with Shopify on the last one. We've talked about the benefits of Shopify Plus and one before. Tons of great content out there. Go and have a look. Now, these aren't sales events we're not asking you to run to the back of the room and sign up or whatever we give up our time to genuinely help others but do go and check out james and his team at the armory do do go and have a look at jay and her team at launch online if you're not on shopify shopify plus consider what you're doing and really think about going to shopify but finally a massive massive thank you for dermot and all the team at gym plus coffee it's been amazing to have you on Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And final shout out to Steve in the audience, who never gets the credit. A lot of the hard work that goes on behind the scenes is by the wonderful thank Steve you. Milton. So a huge thank you to you, Steve. It's been lovely to see you all today. I hope you've all enjoyed it, and we look forward to seeing you on the next show. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Cheers, guys.